so now we have uh, a VAP, Kai <laughs> <Hi>, Golan, <laughs> from <laughs> Bakuyan <Bakuyong> University. <laughs> okay, so uh, the take home message of the study that I want to share with you today is written in the title that there is uh, some dynamical changes in the patterns of uh, ultrasonic vocalizations emitted by PAPS uh, in the ASD model. And in this case, uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Ora uh, Kaufman, uh, we looked at the environmental factors, specifically organic exposure or gestational exposure to organophosphates. Uh, that were uh, very common in use uh, as pesticides, both for uh, agriculture and uh, gardening. Uh, with the time, uh, increased uh, evaluation of the effects of organophosphates caused a decrease in the use of uh, these materials, but still uh, the use is uh, uh, uncontrolled in the majority of the a country and mainly in the small farms and using uh, gardening and uh, and it's there in the air in the water uh, in the foods uh, and when uh, I say organophosphates I don't mean to the toxic effects or uh, of uh, blockage of uh, acetylcholine esterase which is the famous effect of uh, organophosphates, but to uh, the exposure to sub doses that really uh, expose uh, the body, and here we speak about developing the developing uh, uh, fetus to uh, compounds which either are derivatives of the organophosphates or metabolites of the uh, organophosphates that remain there in the earth, in the water, uh, in the food. So uh, this is uh, our focus, and uh, just uh, a few words on uh, the biological effects. Uh, so I didn't say environment and genes, so this is the environmental factor in this case. And um, we have genes that encode for enzymes that know to, uh, um, to break down uh, some of the organophosphates. And genetic variation in these genes or genetic mutations in these genes can interact also with the environment. So it's either the uh, exposure itself uh, as environmental factor or interaction with the uh, genetic uh, background. Uh, so evidences for uh, effects of this uh, continuous exposure to sub-threshold uh, uh, doses it uh, came from several studies, and I cite here just uh, a very few longitudinal studies. Uh, one that was performed in uh, Berkeley University and followed kids at the age of one, two, and three years, and found uh, an increase in the rates of uh, perversive developmental disorders uh, upon exposure. The other one performed in uh, Columbia University and looked at specifically at kids that grow up in what they defined as the inner city. So no exposure to rural uh, areas, just uh, pesticides that were used uh, for gardening. And uh, here they could monitor uh, the levels of uh, specific uh, organophosphate uh, uh, CPF, I will mention it uh, later, and, uh, and compare the levels uh, of the organophosphates in the blood, in the plasma of the kids, and compare ver uh, high versus low uh, concentrations, and found association again with uh, per uh, PDD. Uh, another set of studies uh, uh, that uh, were um, Published later, look specifically at different uh, types of behaviors, and uh, here I refer to ASD-like symptoms or uh, social skills uh, that were uh, correlated. The, the, the phenotype uh, correlated with uh, the urinary levels of metabolites of uh, organophosphate. So in this case, it's an association uh, study, but both uh, uh, of these studies actually follow, uh, they were published uh, like five years ago, but they follow kids that uh, were born or were embryos <laughs> when uh, the use of uh, these uh, compounds was more uh, common in the US. So it's uh, 
not the situation today, but it's uh, in a way showing us that, uh, that there, there is a relation between the two. And in the animal models that uh, Aura used in, uh, for her studies, uh, she used uh, ex uh, gestational exposure uh, during post uh, gestation days 12 to 15, it's around the second month in human pregnancy, uh, exposure uh, uh, of the developing uh, embryos to 2.5 or 5 milligrams per kilo uh, chlorpyrifos CPF. Um, and then uh, they found a uh, delay in the development of uh, sensory motor reflexes and together we discussed also uh, impaired uh, or deficient ultrasonic vocalization. And these mice, when they reach to the age of uh, two months, show impaired in different aspects of uh, social uh, behavior. So for the current study, we use uh, uh, the same uh, study design with the goal to explore the effects of uh, gestational exposure to CPF on patterns of up vocalization in the same uh, model I mentioned before. So the exposure was by uh, Gavage to the mother. She drank it, either she wants it or not, but she gets it. Uh, and uh, the control group receive uh, oil as the vehicle, and then the low CPF and high CPF are the two groups, and the N is the number of uh, uh, dams that receive it. The pups were born uh, naturally and recorded at postnatal day uh, two, uh, five, and uh, eight. So there are, uh, it's in the air, what's the relation between the ultrasonic uh, vocalization and uh, what does it have uh, with communication? So it's a basic way the pup uh, attracts the attention of the mother, so it's kind of uh, communication. And the uh, cause or the stimulus for emitting the, the USV, so there is a, a very wide body of literature dealing with it. Uh, some say it's kind of reflexive behavior, or some say it's due to the uh, decrease in the body temperature of the pup. Uh, so uh, to overcome these uh, questions, we try to use uh, a study design uh, that have some, uh, at least, overcome uh, some of the uh, concerns uh, for the, the really uh, communication nature of the ultrasonic vocalization. So uh, we have here the kids crying, uh, difficult to separate from the mother. And then uh, if you separate the kid from the mother, in some cases he will cry from the mother. A hug from the mother can be really uh, give the comfort needed. But if again uh, the mother disappears, it can result in enhancing the, the response of crying. So at least that's the way it works. <laughs> in a, a wild type uh, normal pup. So the paradigm is uh, as uh, shown uh, to the right. Yes, of course. And uh, we have uh, uh, session of isolation of the pup from the mother, a reunion with the mother for 20 minutes, and uh, a second session of separation. So once I pay mice, uh, at the second session we'll cry higher number of calls and, uh, and we think about it kind of uh, experience dependent. The first time the pup cried, the mother came uh, and then it's, uh, he learns something and the second time you separate the pup from the mother, uh, we'll like call her for <laughs> in a stronger manner. So this uh, paradigm is called the maternal enhancement of uh, pup behavior. And uh, we try to look at the time course of uh, these events in a way that we looked at the first session and the second session, and uh, looking at the first and the six uh, minutes in each of the session, because we saw that there is some time course of the uh, pup behavior. Uh, from the beginning to the end of all this paradigm, the behavior is completely different, and we will see it also in the result. So what uh, Enav did, Enav performed the experiment. Uh, she recorded the pups with a system that uh, we show here. This is an ultrasonic uh, microphone. 
and uh, we analyzed, we looked and analyzed uh, the calls uh, using this uh, in-house uh, developer uh, software in collaboration with uh, John Lederman from the Holon Institute of uh, Technology. And these are the calls or sonograms of, uh, of the calls. Uh, so each of these uh, gray boxes include uh, one syllable emitted or one call emitted by the pap. At the y-axis is the frequency uh, in hertz and in the uh, x-axis is the time. So you can see that there are different types of calls and the yellow uh, try to uh, classi classify them to these different uh, calls uh, based on previous classification and uh, recorded the start and the end of the call and in each of these points we have the time and the frequency so the duration and the intersyllable intervals could be uh, calculated. So another concern, concern I mentioned before is the decrease in the uh, body temperature of the pup. So to avoid uh, this effect, the pups were kept uh, warm using a, a warming pad and uh, we excluded the possibility that they just cry because they are cold. So first, uh, Ayelet found that not all pups under these conditions cold or emit ultrasonic vocalization. We have these two sessions, the uh, first and the sixth minutes uh, um, separately, and you can see that in blue are the uh, number of pups that did not emit calls at all. In red are the pups that call to the mother, regardless the number of the calls. And we can see that in the first session, about half of the pups didn't call the mother at all. However, they really learned something. And in the second session, uh, majority of the pups called to the mother. And uh, this is, uh, that was observed in all uh, the groups. Uh, to quantify the number of calls, uh, Ayelet counted all the calls, but she divided, uh, as I mentioned before, to the 10 categories. It seems to us that it's take too much data and we are like uh, really uh, deep into a lot of numbers, so she grouped them together into three classes or uh, by the complexity level, the simple calls, hop, uh, here on the right, a single vowel, the uh, calls that contain several vowels, like here, frequency steps and uh, two syllables, and harmonic calls that we see here. So these are three uh, categories of complexity, and when she looked at the number of calls from each uh, uh, category, uh, we can see here the enhancement in the number of calls. So, oil first session and two session. The second session, uh, low CPF and high CPF, first session and second session, and the same here. Uh, first and six minutes in each of them. So at the control, we uh, clearly see that uh, there are almost no harmonic calls, but there is an enhancement in the calls of the two other categories. We see a general enhancement by uh, uh, CPF in the low CPF um, group, uh, mainly on the, the simple categories of the simple categories of the calls, and a completely different picture in the uh, group with the high CPF, and altogether an interaction between treatment session and minutes. Uh, uh, is shown here. So each of the groups exposed to the organophosphate uh, uh, responded to it, but uh, in a different manner. Looking at the properties of the calls, uh, she first analyzed the temporal variables, the duration of the call, and the intersyllable interval. So here is the example of a bout of calls, like a burst. Each of the gray is a call, and the distance between them is the intersyllable interval. And we can see here that in the first session, both durations of uh, the calls and the intervals increase um, in the um, high CPF group in green. Uh, and the second session is kind of uh, all the calls seems more or less similarly. So the effect in this case is very, very clear at the first session, but is uh, not present in the second. 
session. However, if we see increasing cold duration and increasing the intersyllable interval, it will affect the time that the uh, mice uh, or the pups called, what we call the voice time. And we see here that uh, this uh, uh, variable was a parameter uh, significantly increased in the second session and not uh, in the first one. So altogether, they, they call more in the second session. So the different variables are affected differently uh, with the time. Uh, to say if there is a specific uh, type of calls that push these results or affected more compared to the others, we see here the same uh, effect of dura uh, on the duration uh, with the three different uh, levels of complexity. The calls that are um, simple calls, uh, the complexity level two and three, and the effect by the treatment. And uh, again, here we saw an effect of the treatment on the simple calls. Computing the intersyllable interval and the complexity level, we can see that in all groups, the simple calls uh, followed by larger interval and the more complex calls are followed by very short intersyllable interval. So there are different uh, aspects that are changed and some of them are changed more at the beginning, some of them are more affected at the end of uh, uh, these uh, recording sessions. Uh, lastly, we looked at the, the spectral uh, variables, the frequency of the uh, begin at the beginning of the call and at the end of the call. And again, we see here that the effect is mainly in the first session, in both of them, and a decrease, like all the tones are lower. If a wild type ma a pup call around uh, 80 kilohertz uh, frequency, so uh, uh, attenuation by at least two, uh, 20 uh, kilohertz uh, was seen in all the uh, treated or ex uh, pups exposed to CPF. And again, a uh, stronger effect at the beginning. And again, we ask if uh, this if a general effect is due to one type of calls or all the calls are affected uh, uh, similarly. And, uh, and we see the complex simple calls, the more complex calls, and the harmonic calls. And at least uh, the general picture is that all types of calls uh, have lower uh, frequency. <laughs> So, uh, I want to uh, bother you with uh, this picture that try to look at each of the different 10 calls to see if one of them dominate uh, uh, or the use of one of them is more uh, dominant and we didn't find any call that was used more by the treated or neglected by the treated. And uh, with this, I would like to summarize. <laughs> that uh, gestation exposure uh, to subthreshold dose of organophosphate, CPF specifically, impact aspects of uh, pap scores, including the complexity, the temporal parameters, and the spectral parameters, but the effect is, is time dependent into the session. And uh, the while stronger CPF have a, a significant effect on the properties of the calls, and we can see here the effects of the high CPF compared to the uh, low CPF, uh, there are some aspects uh, like uh, the spectral parameters that are affected uh, in by both concentrations. And uh, I would like to uh, close with thinking about analysis of behavior uh, both in animals and in humans that uh, these uh, uh, calls were analyzed previously by us as a whole, as a one group of uh, ultrasonic calls. And here we try to look at the time dependency of the changes and we can see that uh, it's exposing uh, the, the, the separation into different sessions or different times into the session expose uh, differences that we couldn't uh, detect before. 
And uh, if we see that some uh, variables are affected mainly at the beginning, and then there is kind of uh, adaptation, or some of the uh, effects are uh, seen uh, mainly at the second like enhancement. It's, of course, the second uh, session compared to the first one. So it's uh, just calling our attention to uh, try to look at different behaviors in the uh, in temporal uh, relevance of the... And, uh, of course, we think it's just distinct uh, circuits mainly that are affected uh, by the CPF. So the people that uh, did the work, uh, Inav uh, and Nat from the uh, Kaufman group, and uh, in our side, they did all the analysis with the software that was developed with by the other students. And uh, just closing with... Uh, a year ago, February 25th, <laughs> uh, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency in the UPS, has stopped or uh, um, actually terminate the use of organophosphates, uh, chlorofirifos specifically, the one that we tested, but uh, the remaining uh, derivatives are still uh, in the air and the water, so be aware. Thank <laughs> you.